one. Good evening, everyone. It is Tuesday, December 6th. It is six o'clock here in New York. It is six o'clock in Mountain Time. Um, my name is Michael DeNovoli. This is another episode of uh, Intro to Developmental Theory and Learning. And tonight we um, are here with Dr. Anne-Marie Neal out in Idaho. So uh, Anne-Marie, if you could introduce yourself. I would be happy to, Michael. And just to correct you, not that I ever want to correct one of my former students, or still students, it is eight o'clock Eastern time and six o'clock Mountain time. What did I say? You said six o'clock Eastern time and six o'clock Mountain time. And, and that is an impossibility. So <laughs> therefore- <laughs> I like it, the time it, travel. So there we go. <laughs> We've had quite a conversation before we hit the record button, so we might be doing some of that as this goes along. But hi, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Dr. Anne Marie Neal. I have a PhD, a master's, and a PhD in clinical psychology, uh, which I got from Michigan State University way back when. Uh, I was also uh, a registered nurse for years, and one of my specialties was psychiatric nursing, which is how I got interested in psychology. Uh, I am, uh, I've done a lot of teaching in the past and also private practice. Uh, I've worked at VA hospitals, for example, with veterans, uh, but I currently teach through the Victor Frankel Institute of Logotherapy based out of uh, Abilene, Texas. And I also teach for the Graduate Theological Foundation where I supervise doctoral dissertations uh, and teach e-courses. Uh, which are similar to, I guess, this course that you're having here on various topics in psychology, like Sigmund Freud, Alfred Adler, Carl Jung, um, a lot of the different uh, developmental and personality theorists, and uh, the Viktor Frankl Institute. I teach courses on Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, just based on uh, the three years uh, the, that he was in uh, three different concentration camps in World War II and also his theory, uh, which we'll talk a little bit maybe about later. So that's, and I know Michael because he took courses from me from me at the Viktor Frankl Institute and is still supposed to do one at some point in the future. So now I'm putting him on notice here by, by this recording that he will eventually do that. I'm just honored to be asked by him to speak with you today. I think we're shooting for the summer for uh, starting the, the, that last course. Yes. Um, so Anne-Marie, I invited you on this week as part of our extra credit module to discuss um, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, um, and then provide a little bit of an opportunity to discuss um, Viktor Frankl, because um, I did a little bit of research and I found out that Maslow and, and Frankl actually had a conversation at some point. So, uh, so we'll start with um, Maslow and... Um, his hierarchy of needs and and humanitarian psychology. So, if you can give a, a like a little basic overview of sure. um, of of Maslow and and his approach to psychology. Sure. And again, this is my understanding, and I might get some of it. I hopefully, get most of it right. But there might be others who might disagree with me to some extent on who Maslow was and why he's so important. Uh, Abraham Maslow was uh, born in the U.S. I think he was born in Brooklyn and raised in Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he uh, he differed from what would be the traditional two forms of psycho uh, personality theory, and one of which everyone thinks of when they think of Sigmund Freud, which was psychoanalytic theory, and the other was behaviorism, which was most people think of as uh, something discovered by uh, uh, Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov, uh, which is classical conditioning. And then the other uh, well-known theorist in behavioral psychology is B.F. Skinner, so uh, who, was, who looked at operant conditioning that we are, uh, we are, uh, we don't have free will. Neither of those two theories believed in free will. They had total opposite reasons for why they felt we had no free will 
But that was the one thing that the behaviorists and the psychoanalysts like Sigmund Freud had in common was they did not believe that we had free will. And so in a sense, uh, we were more like animals in that sense. Uh, and uh, Freud thought that we didn't have free will because we were, uh, we were influenced by uh, these uh, drives for pleasure uh, that were biologically based. Uh, and also we had the constraints and restraints from uh, caregivers that we couldn't even possibly remember when we were children. So we had this super ego, this conscience that was controlling us and we had all these biological urges. And then Skinner and Pavlov came along and they said, well, we don't have free will. And Pavlov said, we don't have free will because, you know, something happens and now we relate something else to that. So the classic Pavlov experiment, of course, was dogs salivate to a bowl of food and then a bell precedes the food and the dog starts to salivate to the bell because he knows food's coming. And B.F. Skinner said, well, we're actually, uh, we are controlled primarily by rewards and punishments. So if I'm rewarded for doing well in this course and I get an A, well, then I'm going to take another course with uh, Mr. Ginobili because maybe I'll get another A from him then, or I'm being rewarded by, by money I get for something or praise that I get. And so it's free will is an illusion, both of those theorists. Well, along came the humanists and they said, that's not true. Uh, we are human beings and by human, because we're human beings, we have free will and that uh, we also can think. It's not just our behavior. It's what's going on inside our heads uh, that we can think about things. We can have emotional responses to events and we can change. We can change in the present. We are not completely controlled by outside forces or internal conflicts as Freud uh, would say. Some psychoanalytic theorists, by the way, do believe in free will, Karen Horney being one of them. So it's not like none of them believed in free will, but classic psychoanalytics, psychoanalytic thinking uh, theorists did not. So along came people like um, Maslow, and Carl Rogers is another one, and they, they said, no, we're thinking human beings and we have the freedom to change based on our thinking, uh, it can affect our emotional responses. It can affect the consequences that we have behaviors. But uh, and for, and so then the but Maslow in particular wanted to look at how do we become the best human beings we can be. That's the way I would look at this. And so he developed what most people think of when they think of Maslow, which is this pyramid. And if we were to be able to pull it up on the screen, or maybe it's in your textbook, it's a classic pyramid that most people have seen in which you have at the bottom things like safety needs, like do I live in a safe environment? You know, is my home life safe? Or do I have caring parents? Do I have enough food? You know, do I have enough sh shelter, food and shelter that we have to have those needs met before we can go to the next level, which would be belonging needs, I think is next, you know, love for and from others. And then we move to even more, uh, more uh, uh, hierarchy of needs, which is how do we become self-actualized? How do we um, become the best human beings we can be? Uh, and and uh, all of a sudden, oh, there we go. So physiologic needs, air, water, food, shelter, safety needs, security, employment, resources, right? Love and belonging, our friendship, our intimacy. Oh, and esteem. How do we have self-esteem and, and self-respect? And then to become the best we can be which he called self-actualization. And he felt that was at the top of the pyramid, but that you had to have these other needs met in order to get to self-actualization. And not everyone agreed with that. Uh, and that's where I guess I'll stop because that's the basic premise of a humanistic psychologist. 
if you looked at Carl Rogers, for example, he looked at the fact that we should treat each other with unconditional positive regard. How do we raise our children? Do we raise them with unconditional positive regard or are we criticizing them for behavior? You're a good girl if you do this. You're a good boy if you do that, rather than I don't like this behavior, but you're still you know, a loving child. Uh, and it doesn't have anything to do. Your behavior does not define you. So I'm getting off on Carl Rogers, which isn't the topic. So I'll stop right there. So um, not only from a um, psychological point of view, but as someone would like, would you also identify uh, as an educator to to a certain extent with, with some of the other things that that you do? Would I identify as an educator in terms of this pyramid? No, 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 not in terms of this pyramid, like in some of the other, the other, um, like the work that you do at um, the different uh, educational organizations that, that you work with, like, do you, like you're a teacher to a certain extent. Right. Now, um, how, how would the understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like inform inform an approach to to teaching i guess you could say like how, how how do you think that um understanding these these hierarchy of needs um would apply to like that like being a teacher like in that type of a setting wow uh well let's see if I were to look at what makes me the best teacher I can be, which I think is your question. All right. Yes. Uh, if I have not had enough sleep the night before, uh, if I uh, do not feel that I have any food in the house to feed my family, uh, if I feel that my employment is in jeopardy or this is safety or that I'm dealing with some personal health problems or security problems. Um, if I feel that right now my friendships are all a mess and uh, my family's in bad shape, uh, then it might be hard for me to do the best I can in that particular day that I'm teaching. So I really always have to be aware, I think, of where I am personally and how do I make sure that I can still do what I need to do to give of myself to others, which is to give to students, if even in the face of some of the these needs in Maslow's hierarchy. Um, I do believe that if I'm not in a profession where I want to be the best I can be, then probably I need to look at changing that profession. So because otherwise, I will be the worst teacher you could ever imagine or right. the worst, you know, person in the business world or the worst stockbroker or whatever it might be. So I do think we have, I do think it's important. I don't think anyone's saying that these are not important needs. Right. It's just a matter of whether or not they all have to be met in order for say me to be able to teach a course in the best possible way. Is that, is that answering your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I would also add that uh, what's nice about Maslow uh, in terms of education is um, in terms of social emotional learning. So not only about us becoming, um, you know, the best teachers that we can be, but also in understanding our students that I do agree with you in the sense that um, for our students, these needs have to be met in order for them to become the best students that they can be. Um, but I think where the our conversation is going is going to move is like, what order do these needs need to be met in order for self actualization to happen, or or you know th things like that. Like, how how did you phrase it before about um, not so much the order of the needs, but um kind of like part of the criticism of maslow oh well part of the criticism is do these needs have to be for example do i have to have the shelter that i would like to have or enough sleep in order to be able to be a good friend in order to be oh. able to have 
love and belonging? And I do I have to have all these safety needs met in order to feel self-esteem? And I would suggest, and many as many theorists have suggested, Frankel for one, that that's not true, that people can, in fact, uh, still love one another, even when they don't have all their physiological needs met or their safety needs met. Uh, we can still feel self-actualized uh, even if we are struggling with some of the very real uh, essential things that we would like ultimately to have in, in, in our particular personal life. So I disagree that these have to be met. I don't think they're not important. It's clearly important and I'm not trying to dismiss them, but I just think that we can still love one another. We can still feel that we've we're fulfilling our life's purpose, even if some of these lower, as he calls, lower level needs aren't met. So I don't like the pyramid per right. se. I, I think these are all important, but the pyramid implies that we have to start at the bottom right. and that we have to be able to do the rest. And I, I just don't see that. That has certainly not been my experience in life. And and I would agree with you. I like Maslow as a guide, but I think that if like I wouldn't consider myself a, a hard Maslowian, if, if if you will, in the sense of that the lower needs need to be met in order for the higher higher ones to be fulfilled later on, um, right. which I think is a is a nice segue into this conversation that Maslow had with uh, with Viktor Frankl. Sure. Well. In order to, let's start a little bit earlier, sure. which is what is Viktor Frankl's theory? Who was Viktor Frankl? In, was he a humanistic uh, theorist uh, or psychologist or psychiatrist? He happened to have a PhD. Uh, he happened to be an MD, a psychiatrist and a neurologist. And he also happened to have a PhD in philosophy is when, when he was released. He was in three, as I mentioned, three concentration camps in World War II. He was from Vienna. And when he was released from the camps is when he wrote his book, Man's Search for Meaning, which is partly about his experience there. But his theory, uh, his existential theory was developed way before then. It, in the early 20, 1920s, for example. So he went back to school and got a PhD in philosophy after he was released from the camp. So what kind of a theorist is Viktor Frankl? Well, he's not a, he's certainly not a psychoanalyst, although he was trained in psychoanalysis. Almost anyone in those days who went to medical school and for psychiatry, and, and he did, was trained under uh, in psychoanalysis because Freud was the first. And Frankl always said he stood on the shoulder of giants and always gave credit to those who came before. But he decided that long-term psychoanalysis was not necessary, that you could help someone in a very short-term way. But what he really was, was an existential theorist. So how is that different from a humanistic theorist? Well, both believe in free will and both believe that we're human beings. Uh, but uh, Frankel believed that, which is different from, say, being part of the animal kingdom. But Frankel believed, uh, as an existential theorist, the main question of an existential theorist is, why are we here? Why are we, why were we born in general? Not just why am I born, although that's the major question for each of us, but we are born and we're finite beings. That is, we're going to eventually, sad to say, we're all going to eventually die. I don't know of anyone that doesn't die. There was a very famous comedian named George Burns, who I'm sure none of you've ever heard of, but you can look him up. Uh, and when he was 90 something, he said at a stand up comedy uh, gig that he gave that he wasn't going to die because somebody else had already done that exit. <laughs> but in point of fact, he lived to be, I think, 99 and he eventually, of course, did die. But we often think we're immortal, even at my age. You know, this whole concept of death is sometimes very foreign to me. So but. So the existential theorist wants to know, well, why are we born? Why are we here? What, what is the meaning of our existence? And people who are struggling with that often have what Viktor Frankl called existential vacuum, where everything just, nothing makes sense. Life makes no sense. Why am I here? Why was I born? 
And, uh, and so it gets very difficult sometimes. So an existential theorist is really looking at that. And Frankel believed that we are here for self-transcendence. He believed that we are spiritual beings on a human journey. Uh, and that uh, and that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with a belief in, in a traditional God. You can certainly believe in God and be an existential theorist or believe that we're here for self-transcendence. But atheists are logotherapists, which is his theory, uh, and people who believe in the laws of the universe or the laws of science or the laws of nature, for example, uh, as, as an ultimate meaning. But Frankel believed that we are here for self-transcendence. That is, each of us has a responsibility to give of ourselves to others in the world. And that's the highest purpose that we have. That's why we're here. And we have many different ways we can do that. Creative gifts is one, like being a professor, or being a teacher, or being an educator, or being a programmer, a computer programmer. Um, and that we also... Uh, uh, become self-transcendent through love for from others uh, and through our appreciation of art and beauty and nature. And if we can't change a situation, we always have the freedom to change our attitude. So when he looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he disagreed with him about the fact that self that, that uh, self-actualization was the highest level for us to achieve. And I am very blessed to be able to share with you that I received a, a response back from Viktor Frankl's grandson, whose name is Alexander Vesely. Alec, uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, his first wife died in the camps, but he married again afterwards. And he and his wife, Ellie, had a daughter, Gabrielle, and Gabrielle had two children, one of whom is Alex Vesely, who has a master's in psychotherapy, as well as being, of course, a, a, someone who knows his grand, knew his grandfather very well, and grew up with his grandfather, was very, very close to his grandfather, uh, and um, has many wonderful stories to tell about Frankel. So when I heard that uh, Mr. Denobly wanted to talk about Maslow's uh, conversation with Frankel, my first thought was, well, I always heard about this possible conversation with Frankel, but did that conversation really happen? Or was it just, is that just an apocryphal story, not something real? So I wrote to, um, to uh, Alex, who's in Vienna right now, and lo and behold, he wrote me back. And I would like to share with you what he said about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and um, because my question to him was, uh, did, according to my student, Michael, Maslow, uh, after he had a conversation with Viktor Frankl, uh, added self-transcendence to the top of self-actualization in his pyramid of hierarchy of needs? Um, and was this true? that he had actually added that. And this is what Alex wrote back to me. Yes, everyone knows Maslow's pyramid. What is less known is that when, he said Victor, but I'll say, when Dr. Victor Frankel criticized Maslow, Maslow said back to uh, Victor Frankel that he was right and he changed his pyramid, he changed it, he changed his pyramid. Yet, uh, according to uh, Alex Vesely, Maslow still left self-actualization on top. Whereas he, uh, Alex said to me, whereas as you know, Viktor Frankl would, have, would also have turned that pyramid upside down. So think about the pyramid and turning it upside down. Self-transcendence, Alex went on to say, is the very basis and hallmark of human experience. I'll repeat that. Self-transcendence is the very basis and hallmark of human experience. So if you turn the pyramid upside down, what's first is self-transcendence. Hmm. And through self-transcendence, we become self-actualized. In fact, I wrote back to him and I said, um, uh, yes, Dr. Frankel would certainly turn that pyramid upside down 
as would or should all of us who understand that self-transcendence is our primary reason for being for being spiritual beings on this human journey. And I just told him that I told another student of mine that I cannot think of another personality theorist except for Viktor Frankl who understood this, that self-transcendence is the, the very reason that we're here. Uh, and then uh, I wrote, there is a book that Frankl wrote in his 90s, a year before he died. He died at 92. When he was 91, he dictated this little book called Recollections, which is basically his talking about his life from birth to, the po to that point in time. And he dictated to one of his colleagues and friends. And he said, and I wrote back to Alex, I, I read in Recollections, Victor Frankl's later in life memoir, that it is through self-transcendence that we become self-actualized. I had thought this for years and somehow in my own hubris, which is my own high sense of self, thought this was my unique idea only to discover that your grandfather had already understood this. So I must have read it in his own words. Too bad that Maslow never updated his pyramid. He lost a wonderful opportunity to set his theory on the right path. So that's how I would try to explain the difference. First of all, existential theorists are looking at why are we here? Why are we born? What's our purpose in life? Frankl would say we're here for self-transcendence, to give to others in the world of the gifts that each of us have. And we're each unique. So if I don't do whatever it is I'm capable of doing in my lifetime, it won't happen. Someone else will be here having this conversation with you, but it won't be me. So it's not in a sense to say, oh, this is overwhelming, but just to recognize that each of us has a unique meaning and purpose in life. And that that is really what the existentialists want to uh, help us understand better. What is my unique ability? I have a responsibility to provide my gifts, my love for and from others. I not only have a responsibility, by the way, if you hyphenate that word, response hyphen ability, I have the ability to respond. I'm capable of responding. It doesn't have to be something elaborate. It could be, you know, calling a friend when I hang up and say, how are you doing? Or writing a funny joke to my daughter on uh, on this text that we do back and forth. It, it doesn't have to be something like developing a theory of personality like Viktor Frankl did or Maslow's hierarchy of needs or, or Sigmund Freud's whole incredible theory of, of, of development. So that's it for me. And Marie, I always love uh, listening to you talk. I think I could ask a few more questions, but I think I think what you just said there was 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 a great nutshell. But also from the point of view of of the course that I just taught, you kind of like summarize a lot of the theories all at once and how they build on each other, and and how they how they how they meet together and how they. Um, also criticize each other, which is also important in understanding different different types of theories. Um, I think when we look at Maslow, what I appreciate about Maslow is is understanding, as you said at the beginning, um, you know, from a from a teacher point of view, where you're dealing with human beings, you know, you're not dealing with um, uh, individuals who do not have a free will, who just like spontaneously came up out of nowhere and they're just now they're sitting in front of you in your classroom they are human beings who have all of these different variety of needs that i would say in general i think where maslow goes off is where he says like there's an order in which they need to be met but they have these needs that need to be met in order to learn like if they're hungry they're going to have a little bit more difficulty learning if they're hungry if they're homeless they're going to have a little bit more difficulty learning if they're homeless. So they have these needs that need to be met. But then what I personally appreciate as an educator, where we bridge that gap to, to Frankel, is understanding like where should the focus of education be? And it's not simply self-actualization. It's not simply 
you know, young people discovering this is who I am, but like, what is my purpose? Uh, what, what, what is going to bring meaning to my life, which is definitely well beyond simply self -act self actualization. So I appreciate you uh, visiting us today. I know, I know you originally didn't want to do a recording, but I'm glad you. Uh, I wasn't a fan. <laughs> I will say this though: if you look at the people that Maslow called self-actualized, they're almost they were all self-transcended. So, uh, you know, he he looked at, for example, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. You know, you could think of others that he would have called self-actualized, like Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Mother Teresa, Gandhi. I mean, he certainly didn't put Machiavelli up there, for right. example, as a self-actualized person. So they were all self-transcendent people, which I find very interesting. So even though he didn't call himself transcendent, that's what they were actually doing with their lives. Uh, was being self-transcendent and giving of themselves to others in the world. So uh, right. I'll give you the last word. If there's anything else you would like to add before we uh, close out for the night. Well, I think that was my last word, just <laughs> to say that both of these theorists, the humanistic theorists and the existential theorists, both recognize that we are human beings on the, whether we believe we're on a spiritual journey, a human beings, a spiritual beings on a human journey, or just human being, that we are more than simply on, on uh, our rewards and punishments, uh, which is the behaviorist. We are more than all of these unconscious conflicts and uh, repressed memories from childhood that we, we are free to change in the present uh, and that we have uh, um, responsibility and the ability to respond to life's challenges, each and every one of us. And yes, if you're all going to be educators someday, then I think it's important to understand why you're doing it and also what your students need. And they can, ch and that can change at any moment. Always be prepared for the question you're not ready to answer and be willing to say, I don't know, I'll get back to you tomorrow. So <laughs> that's it. That's it for me. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank, uh, thank you for inviting me. Of course. Uh, for my students, the, uh, the only thing that I'm going to cover on uh, on Canvas on the website is the reflection that you can do to earn extra credit based off of the, the conversation that we had this evening. Um, and I'm also going to be posting the, um, the study guide for the final next week. And then that's it. Then they'll be done with the, done with the course. We can put it in the, uh, the history books and, and say we're done. So Anne-Marie, thank you again for coming. And I always appreciate you uh, coming to visit uh, any of my students because uh, I, I think you're just a, um, a fountain of knowledge and and you're you always got really great insights. I always love listening to you to speak. And you were saying before, like we we had already been talking for like two hours before the, we even started this conversation. I know I miss talking with you, but you're so busy these days. So and by the way, um yeah. Uh, it's just uh, it, it's just wonderful to be able to to be part of of this educational process that you're doing with your students and and so you know I just hope and oh I know what I wanted to say always do extra credit if you're offered it I have had students who so wish they had done that extra credit because it would have made the difference between one grade and the next so no pressure but just to rem remember that extra credit is a gift that um, keeps on giving as long as you take advantage of it. So that's it. Thank you so much. So good night from New York and you're saying good night from Idaho. From Boise, Idaho, right. Where the mountains are gorgeous. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Right.